uh, Roisin Shortle. You're on mute. Roisin, you're on mute. Keep talking to Apologies. us. Apologies. Sorry, ap apologies there, Chair. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and for your presentations. My first questions relate to the rollout of the vaccine program in nursing homes. And you know, the, the original target date was that all nursing homes would, residents and staff would receive the first vaccine uh, over a week ago. Uh, for various reasons that hasn't happened. And the minister has told us that, you know, there's four nursing homes uh, where no vaccines have been provided. And then in another 117 nursing homes, there are significant numbers who didn't receive the vaccine, again, for various reasons. What is the total number of people involved in those two groups uh, between residents and, and uh, staff? Um, uh, so, Deputy, I won't, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a, a, a detail uh, at the level that you're talking about, although it is available. I know that you had a session on Friday in relation to the overall vaccination programme. Ninety-seven percent of our long-term, of the uh, nursing homes have had the first dose, as you've said, four of those uh, yeah, sure. have Th not th had th so thanks. far. And that is Sorry, about sorry if, if I could, could just yeah. come in there. Sorry, we've been asking these questions of the Minister and I was hoping okay. we might get answers this morning. You don't have Sorry. the number in terms of I the number have, of people. I don't have the number within the 117 uh, nursing homes that have to be returned to for dose one uh, because of for clinical presentation reasons couldn't yes, receive I, their vaccine at I the appreciate time. That. So 117 nursing homes and the numbers of staff and residents yeah. I can't give you today. Okay, that, that's unfortunate because it's important that we know that number. Uh, sure. And we were told that there are significant numbers within those 117. So can you get us that number and come back to us as soon as possible? Yeah. Because we were seeking it at last week from the minister. Okay. We could provide it. We'd like it now. I, just want, yeah. to, I would just want to pose that question again. What are the arrangements for rolling out the vaccine programme in religious nursing homes? Well, they will. They, that will align with the sequencing on the older, over 65s and vulnerable groups in relation to the wider sequencing. So, and so there are there are no arrangements yes. to include them in congregated settings. No, I think to be fair, okay. um, deputy. Okay. That, no, actually, no. For clarification, to be fair, deputy, they are identified as a vulnerable group within the over 65s, and when supply is available, they will be part of a determination of congregated settings. Okay, but that's what I said. They're including them yeah. with all over 65s. They're not identifying not. specific uh, congregated settings. Is that right? Uh, so I think just and we might be uh, uh, sort of um, getting caught up on words here, but absolutely they are a vulnerable group because of the congregated setting that they live in and we are identifying them and they will be part of that uh, prioritised group. So when will they, when will just, the yeah, vaccine programme be rolled out for them? Just, just to flag, Deputy, I, I, the prioritisation ex exercise obviously happens through the National uh, um, yeah. uh, Immunisation Advisory Council. So there is an exercise that's going on with them uh, between themselves and the uh, office, uh, the office of the Chief Clinical Officer at the moment okay. to prioritise uh, those other congregated okay. settings, including those religious orders, as to who might be next okay. uh, uh, prioritised for, for for that. So they're not. They're not. As of now, they're not in the priority groupings as a specific group. Um, okay, I want to move on then to the fact that we find ourselves yet again in a situation where there are extremely high uh, rates of the virus and death rates in the nursing home sector. And it's very hard to believe that we're, we're back in this situation, given you know the experience of last April and May and where yet again now NEFID are saying, expressing serious concern, uh, very high numbers similar to last April and May, and they're referring to a deteriorating epidemiolog epidemiological profile in long-term residential care facilities. And you do have to ask the question, have we not learned lessons from that first wave, which was so tragic? And, you know, there were three lessons that were identified at that point. 
um, from that awful experience. And the first was that there was no clinical oversight of private sector nursing homes, that the state was operating an arm's length approach to older people's care. And, the, you know, this was a major gap in services, that there was no clinical oversight whatsoever of private nursing homes. The second lesson that we talked about learning was the fact that it is not an ideal situation for older people to find themselves in congregated settings. Not ideal, you know, from a health perspective, certainly in relation to a pandemic and also socially. And the third area was the chronic underfunding of home care. Now, this was identified, those three lessons were identified in the expert panel. They are, have been known for a long time by many of the, the advocacy groups working with older people, particularly SAGE, I think. And it was also recognised at a political level. Those of us in opposition have recognised these for a long time, but it was recognised at government level, uh, you know, last summer, that these were lessons that had to be learned. We had to find a new model of care for supporting and caring for older people. So I'm asking in relation to those three areas that have had been well flagged and identified last summer, the lack of clinical oversight, the fact that, you know, too many older people are in congregated settings and we needed a new model of care um, and the statutory right to home care. And the third area, the underfunding of, of, of social care for older people. What has been done about those three major areas that had been identified last summer? Uh, Deputy Shortall, so in, earlier on my colleague um, Sandra referenced the uh, significant investment in home care this year, which is exactly as you're describing as what was required, which is 5 million additional hours in home care, which has allowed us uh, uh, um, offer home care to a considerable number of people what, what and number? our What's policy... the additional number? Oh, Shane, you've way over your time. So, sorry, 12. Can we let the guests... 12. Yeah, so it's 1,200. Out of London. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. So, and, and that has actually meant as well the reduction in, uh, a significant reduction in waiting uh, lists for people for home care. And keeping, you'll know that our model of care is, uh, is uh, for maintaining people at home, thus also additional investment in uh, rehab supports as well to maintain people at home. Uh, and Deputy Lahart earlier referred uh, the question around the reducing numbers of older people in our nursing homes. So I think in terms of that model, uh, for congregated settings, we have responded to the learnings uh, from the last time around. I know that my colleague Kathleen McLennan from the Department of Health, who leads on the implementation oversight for the expert panel, will also be able to uh, respond around sorry, the. Sorry, um, sorry. With, with all due, I, due respect, sorry, with, with all due respect, we were supposed to have a statutory right to home care at this point. So why are we I'm not allowed, seeing that? And why is I'm it delayed? My colleague, I suggest my colleague Kathleen might respond to that. Dr. McClelland in, please. Thanks very much. Um, I think firstly just to say 150 million extra funding has gone into home care this year to deliver an extra 5 million home care hours. 127 million has gone in to configure um, 1,250 beds for immediate care, intermediate care, so to provide for a reablement model in the community. Um, the SRI is just completing a demand and supply model for us um, in relation to part of the basis for the statutory home care scheme. Significant funding has gone in for the establishment of a national home care office, which will underpin um, the statutory home care scheme um, and that's um, scheduled as part of the NSP for 2021 in addition to the rollout of the inter-eye single assessment tool of which funding has gone in for 128 um, inter-eye assessors. So there has been significant progress there in terms of increasing the capacity and progressing the key elements of the statutory home care scheme. We have um, taken significant lessons and learning from the evolving disease and what has happened internationally and one of the clear things for us and the EC CDC, NEFET um, and HICWA have all said in their risk assessments, high levels of community transmission makes it absolutely impossible to keep COVID-19 out of our nursing homes. Okay, so our job... What, what has happened on, in relation on, to Roisin, clinical Roisin, oversight? Roisin, Roisin, there's other so, people sorry, looking to get in as well. I don't have the time here this morning. So can clinical we... Clinical oversight was the key area that was identified. What has been done about that? 
So in relation to clinical oversight, the expert panel identified very clearly that the person in charge of the nursing home has responsibility for clinical governance within that nursing home with the support of the GPs. Work has started to scope um, what that clinical governance model might look like and also the HSE work is working to scope how it might start engage in, engaging with the, um, the general practitioners. As you'll understand, the key engagement with the general practitioners over the last period of time has been in relation to the vaccination work roll out but it is a priority and it is part of the work of the implementation oversight team at the minute okay thank you uh, i need to move on to uh, our next uh